All right. Uh, so as you know, the way Jumpstart works is after the quick preview that we just had um, from our collab staff. Uh, and yes, Nick, I have just <laughs> put you on the collab staff. Uh, we are now going to move to our guest speaker for today. Um, yesterday, we heard from Dave Cormier, who talked to us about um, instructional design for information abundance. Um, with student connection um, at the heart of what we do. Uh, today, I think we are going to get more into the nitty gritty of design. And as Martha and I were brainstorming about who we could invite, who could really give you um, some concrete takeaways for people who may be spending part of today actually lining up some of your um, syllabi, getting ready to think about spring. Um, we landed on Jordan Noyes because um, Jordan is just an absolutely magical combination of somebody who embodies all the principles of the ACE framework and of the stuff that Dave Cormier was talking about yesterday, um, but also has a ton of experience in instructional design for online environments. Um, so in her work at Muhlenberg, Jordan has been at the forefront of creating some of the most innovative assignments. I remember being in a room with Jordan one time and I made a joke, which uh, my husband who is probably on this Zoom right now will appreciate about how college campuses went out and spent millions of dollars on 3D printers, and yet nobody has ever effectively used a 3D printer for any academic or intellectual reason that's useful in any university. And I was just, you know, laughing, kind of making fun of Phil who does uh, 3D printing. But I was also joking about, you know, we buy these expensive things, people print doodads, like what's the point? And Jordan said, well, actually, let me tell you about an assignment I worked on with a history professor. And she told me about this assignment where they had um, created new monuments. Part of this was during some of the um, uh, controversy that was happening about what constitutes an ethical monument. And so they designed new monuments, um, 3D printed them, installed them, and then had unveiling ceremonies where they explained their monuments and talked about them. Um, and it was just a really beautifully designed assignment. Um, so she's really known for creating some out of the box assignments that use technology in interesting ways, but she's done that in the context of some really classic best practices in instructional design, like mapping to learning outcomes and um, the kind of clarity that Dave was talking about yesterday. So we invited Jordan to talk to you today about assignment design and again on Friday talking about assessments. And I can already see Phil back talking to me in the chat. Um, so with that, I am going to uh, ask Jordan to step forward and I will toss it over to you and uh, Martha and Hannah and I will keep an eye on your chat as we go through. Hey, thank you so much, Robin. Um, I don't know that anyone's ever described me as magical. So that's that's a fun way to start the morning. So thank you. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here with everyone this morning. I sat in on Dave's talk yesterday um, and then spent like an hour trying to process it afterwards. Um, and as Robin said, this morning might feel a little bit different because I think I'm gonna dive a little more into how do we actually build some of these assignments? How do we take things that we really care about and create them in online spaces? Um, so we're definitely gonna roll up our sleeves um, and do some of the, the nitty gritty work, but still take what Dave talked about, about that sense of care for ourselves, for our students, for what we do, um, and pull it in from this, low, not low level, but from this, you know, in the weeds level of, of building care into each assignment that we have. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing. Oh, Robin, can I please share? That should give you the power. Thank you. Should have done that before. Appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and present here. Okay, so yes, yeah, so designing assignments for 
online environments. And I say online environments, but really everything that we talk about in this presentation can also be applied to assignments in a face-to-face -face class as well. There are absolutely things that no matter what medium you teach in, um, whether that be some sort of hybrid or you know, solely face-to-face, -face, these can absolutely transition into any of those spaces. So what I wanted to do right off um, at the start of this presentation was ask everyone to take just a minute and think about three assignments in one of your courses that you would protect with like your whole life, that you're like, no matter what space I teach in, these assignments are so important to the learning outcomes of our students or the engagement of my students. And I really don't wanna let those things go. So you are this panda and you will not release those. So just go ahead and take like 30 seconds. And if you wanna share them with the whole group and add them to the chat, great. Um, but I also recommend just kind of jotting them down in front of you so that you have them as we go along um, and you can maybe take some notes on ways to engage with those assignments. I'm just gonna take a break. Okay. All right, so hopefully you have a couple assignments that you, you know, you really care about, that you feel strongly about. And what I want you to think about next is how would you rank these assignments? And what I mean by this is where do you feel you are with that assessment? Is it something that's ready to go that you're like, if I had to teach tomorrow, this thing is good, I would send it off to my students. Is it something that you're like, it needs a little work, but it's a minor adjustment, so maybe it's gonna take up to 30 minutes. Um, oh, and the, small typo on my part, is it a major adjustment? So 30 plus minutes. Is this something that you're like, I really care about this, but it definitely needs some work. So just kind of think about where that sits right now. Okay. All right. So what I wanna move on to next is the actual transformations that can take some of these assignments that you love so much and hold dear to the learning space um, that you create and rethink how you can do these in different spaces um, and how you can uh, you know, scale them up if you have a large class or if the structure of your class changes, how can we change along with these things? So hopefully for the next you know, 10, 15 minutes, um, you know, you're going to see things that don't feel radical. Um, nothing about what we're going to talk about today should feel like it's the most radical idea you've ever heard in your life. These are all meant to be small transformations that you can make at the start of the semester, that you can make halfway through the semester when you're like, that's not working. I need to pivot just a little bit um, to see if I can make this a more successful assignment for my students. And so I apologize for starting the morning off this way, but we're gonna start with discussion boards. The way that I thought about this was what are some of the most common types of assignments that we use or things that we do in the classroom and how do those translate online? And I feel like discussion boards come up constantly in my conversations with faculty. Um, pros of discussion boards, they are the most obvious space where engagement can happen. I want to emphasize can happen. They are not by their very nature or by their very design going to support in, an engaged um, community. We have to put a lot of work into those spaces for them to be successful and engaging for our students, right? So maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, yeah, I'm not a huge fan. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. Discussion boards can take up a lot of cognitive load. They can feel like a lot of extraneous load. They're not always designed well. And if you're going through 50 threads, um, that's a lot. That's a lot to, to sift through. It's a lot to engage with. Um, it can feel like a time suck or a time drain when you're trying to grade or provide feedback, especially formative feedback to students. Um, and I think sometimes too, we feel that engagement is not as great as it could be in those spaces that maybe 
some of the answers are kind of overthought, um, being phoned in a little bit, that sometimes students wait for that first person to post and then they're like, okay, I can kind of rearrange or reiterate what's being said here. So there's a lot of ways that discussion boards have not been successful, um, but hopefully some of these suggestions will help build in those spaces so that they feel a little more successful online. So one of my favorite strategies for doing work on discussion boards um, and engaging students, especially in large classes, especially as you scale up the number of students or the number of discussions in a course to try to maintain engagement is to use groups. So there are a ton of ways that you can use groups and discussions. I've listed one suggestion here, but there are definitely many, many ways that you can um, work with this. But one of my favorite, and I think one of the most simple ways to use groups and discussions is to essentially have, you know, you have that standard, we have a prompt, you respond to the prompt, you respond to your other students. That's kind of the traditional makeup of a discussion board. So with groups, one of the ways that you can get around some of the cognitive load, um, and some of the engagement, um, the stress of engaging, I know as a student, discussion boards were the most stressful thing. I hated the idea that I had to think of this like clever post and then I had to reply to two students at some later point in time, like it just felt stressful. So with groups, you can have one group responding to an initial prompt and then a second group coming in and responding to them. So it feels a little more conversational. It feels a little less stressful as you know, an individual coming into, you know, I just have to provide my original thoughts to this prompt and then I don't have to worry about coming back to monitor that space um, to engage with other students who maybe just kind of reiterated what I already said or I've reiterated what they've already said. So giving the space for different groups to interact with one another. Um, and depending on the size of your course, I even, you know, kind of in this example wrote out groups C and D too. So you can have it so that some groups have a week off from discussions or a day off from discussions, or you can even engage them in a way that while group A and B are doing the you know, predominant amount of writing and responding and engaging with one another, group C and D are summarizing the thread. So they're still getting the conversation, but again, rather than sort of that stress of having to come up with all of these unique replies, they're summarizing what their fellow, um, their, their peers have done in this space. So they're still getting that conversation, um, but without kind of, again, what we all expect or sometimes see in discussion boards, which is just sort of, I changed a word, but I said the same thing. So group work can be super helpful in these spaces. Similar to that, um, we found that some faculty have had a lot of success with appointing student moderators. So student moderators, same thing. They're kind of providing a summary at the end of the conversation of what's going on for everybody, but they can also be a great way of providing feedback. Um, and again, if, if, if a student's gonna provide feedback to their peers or a group of students is gonna provide feedback, I think it's incredibly important to provide a clear rubric. And this can be something that you create as the instructor, but I think that right off at the beginning of the semester, a collaborative rubric that you develop with students um, can be a great way of setting the tone and expectations of what the discussion space looks like and how it's going to develop and be engaging. So kind of highlighting for them why this space matters because they're probably coming in with similar thoughts and feelings about discussion spaces. Um, they don't always feel authentic. So how, you know, inviting them in to create the, again, the expectations, the etiquette around these spaces and, and how their participation in these spaces is going to be, um, if you choose to grade, graded, uh, can be incredibly valuable to making these spaces more meaningful as well. So student moderators can be a really great way of doing that. Um, and again, I think, What's great about having these summaries is when students go back to look at the work that they've done in the class, the readings they've covered in the class, whatever it is you sort of, you know, support your prompts around, 
they have these great things to quickly go back and look at. It doesn't feel like this, again, huge cognitive load to be like, oh, I have to go through this very long thread to get any idea of what we talked about that week. Like instead they're coming back to this nice little summary. And they're like, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what I remember from the reading. Um, and it just provides them with a great, um, a great little study material as well. Okay. So a little bit different from groups um, and some instructors have not always loved this, but I have seen some instructors have great success with this is using thematic topics for your groups does require a little more work from the instructor side, right? Because you're setting up multiple discussion threads. Um, but what's really nice about thematic topics is that if you, cho if you choose, um, if, you can go for just a module or for the whole semester under these themes, but you're inviting students to choose the space that interests them the most in your course. So you're allowing them to have this choice of where they want to engage or what material is the most interesting to them um, in this larger conversation. So what it does is it can also really- Second, Jordan? Yeah. Martha, I have to take a phone call. Can you pick up the live captioning for me? Do you hear me, Martha? I think she just gave you a thumbs up. I do hear okay. you. Uh, yeah. I'll go down to closed captions and you should be able. Can you do that to say I will live caption or is it not going to let you? Um, Sorry, everybody. I said I would caption. Thank you. I think you have to give me captioning permission. It doesn't. Yeah, let me stop oh. share for a second. Sorry, Jordan. No, no, no. Let me just stop the share. Maybe that will help. I don't know why it, now that I've seized control of the captions, <laughs> it won't let me give them up. Okay, well, I have this. Jo the other option, Jordan, could you turn captioning on on Google Slides? Why are, you yeah. just are you on Google? Yeah, I'm on Google. I can turn on captions there too. Perfect. Thank you, Jordan. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I will do this. Yeah, because my live captioning is not so good anyway. So, okay. I'll be back in a second. Thanks, everybody. I can pick up. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, not a problem. Let me just go back. Let's see, is it okay at the bottom? Is that positioning okay? Okay, great. All right, sorry, let me just pull, re-pull up the chat here so I can have that. All right, so uh, thematic topics, right. Um, so the themes can just be a really great way of allowing students to explore the things that they're most interested in. And what I really liked about the way they worked out in one of our history instructors courses is the students in each theme became very comfortable with one another. So in this 30 person course, there were four themes and it did balance out fairly well. Um, and those students were, you know, you didn't see sort of this awkwardness and they felt really comfortable engaging with one another. And I think that can be a great way of, of helping build sort of like these smaller groups and these smaller communities within your course. And I know that the hope is always that we can build this like large classroom community and online spaces and it's very important. And I know Bonnie's gonna talk a lot about that on Thursday, but I think creating these little pockets can be very helpful as well because as long as you can get students to connect in some way, in any way, um, we know that it's going to enhance their, their learning. And these thematic topics can, can help create those smaller groups um, and create that trust and comfort with one another that, you know, again, Dave spoke a lot about yesterday. And then the last sort of suggestions around discussion boards are to be flexible. So open up the types of engagement that student can have in a discussion board. Uh, if your LMS allows these things, right? So most of them have some built-in audio and video components. 
And these can be a great way of giving students options again on how they're going to engage with the discussion. So for some of us, writing is a completely different experience than the way we speak um, in terms of engagement. So I tend to overthink my written responses and I might take 30 minutes to write a really short paragraph. But if I flip on the camera and respond, it might be five minutes of engagement where I say pretty much the same thing. But for me, the, the audio or the video response feels a little more uh, natural and a little more laid back than monitoring my written response. So we've seen that student engagement can really, um, you know, be a little bit better if you give that flexibility of how they're allowed to respond. And part of that is we have to model that as instructors too. We have to be comfortable turning on the camera or doing an audio recording um, and engaging with captioning and things like that so that students feel comfortable in that space too. Um, but I just think allowing them to come in where they're most comfortable, again, is going to show that level of care and help them engage more with your course. So finally, I have added for those of us that are like, you know, I've tried some of these things and discussion boards, they're just still not my space. Really don't enjoy them. There are other spaces that can have similar engagement um, opportunities for students that still feel like a discussion space that they're going to be relatively familiar with. Um, and I've just put a couple here. I really like VoiceThread. It's one that I work with a lot. So it's, um, you engage around media, it has threaded replies, it offers the same written video audio potentials, it does have captioning services. So that can be a great space to turn to if you, especially if you want to work around YouTube clips or short media clips, um, or um, I work I teach art history, so we work with images a lot, and I really like that space for analysis and things like that. Um, I've also listed Padlet. Padlet can be a really great space, and students don't have to sign up for accounts or anything. So that's another space that um, can make a great discussion forum. You can move things around. It's kind of, it's really flexible in that way. Um, blogs, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, a lot of our, or a few of our faculty work with blogs. Their courses are completely open online and, and the students engage by commenting on each other's blogs, by, um, you know, pinging each other's blog posts and, and creating this network throughout their course time. So that's one way of engaging. And then finally, Hypothesis is a really great space where you can have discussions as well. Um, so again, that's gonna be around some sort of written document. Um, but those spaces all afford the same idea of what a discussion board is. But if you're just someone that's really not feeling that discussion board space anymore, um, they can be great platforms that also, you know, have worked through some of the, or at least we've worked through a lot of those student privacy issues and things like that. So again, things you wanna consider when you switch to using a different kind of tool outside of the LMS, but also a great opportunity for students to own some of their work outside of the LMS. So those are some of the suggestions around discussion boards. I'm sure that you all have plenty others as well, but hopefully these feel like small steps that you can take. Um, and part of why I've suggested a lot of these too is with instructor time in mind. So. I think we all know that it can take forever to read through discussion threads and things like that. So some of these suggestions also will hopefully free up some of your time um, and remove some of that fatigue that we were talking about this morning as well. All right. So the next one that I took a look at was exams, which feel like a pretty traditional part of many courses. And again, I know Dave spoke a lot about this yesterday around conversations with cheating and things like that. So we've been thinking about that at Muhlenberg for a while as well, trying to avoid that ever-present push to switch to proctoring services and things like that. And what we've done is really consider what exams are trying to do and how can we build them differently so that we don't have to engage with any of these proctoring services. 
And so one thing that a lot of exams are doing, especially a multiple choice exam, a lot of our intro level courses, or a lot of the pushback we get from certain, you know, some instructors saying, well, they just need to know this information. It's really important that they know this information is we try to push back and say, okay, so this is a memory and a retrieval that type of learning. That's what we're looking for. Like that's what you're trying to engage with and, and find, you know, see if students have been successful at retaining some of this information. So as a memory and retrieval pr practice, that doesn't mean that it has to be a multiple choice exam. There are many, many ways to engage with those types of learning. And so these are just three suggestions about alternatives that we suggest to a lot of our faculty who feel strongly about having these multiple choice quizzes and things like that. And they work really well paired with that traditional model. So if, if you feel like it's still really important to have that multiple choice quiz or exam throughout your course, these can be a great way of pairing that with another alternative. So the first one that we suggest is developing a study guide. And these can be individual study guides or collaboratively done um, in groups. But essentially asking students to summarize everything they've learned in a unit or a module and create their own study guide as if they were going to take a test or an exam. And that's a great way of one, asking them to go back into the information, or, you know, all of the information that they've learned in this module, um, and two, kind of further cementing it by making them repractice it, write it down, acknowledge it, to help try to maintain that um, long-term memory of the information. The second is to go back to flashcards. And those can be the traditional paper, you know, like index card flashcards, or those can be done online. There's a lot of really great software that allows you to create flashcards online now. Um, and again, there are ones that allow you to do this collaboratively. And so asking students to create flashcards, much like creating a study guide, is again, just going to reintroduce that information to them, ask them to go through this information, decide for themselves what's important um, and help with that memory and retrieval process. And then the last one, which I think we can all acknowledge is a really great way of showing whether or not you've learned or retained information is asking them to teach it. So teach it to the, core, the class, do presentations, or ask them to identify their own audience. So maybe they want to teach it to their five-year-old brother or they want to teach it to their grandmother, or they want to teach it to the barista down the street, like anyone, but they choose the audience that they want to engage with. And then they try to teach the material that they've learned. And what's nice about that is one, you're asking them to identify an audience and then think about what levels of understanding that audience needs in order to you know, understand what they're trying to teach. But then also, again, that memory and retrieval process, asking them to think back on what they've learned and then try to share it in a similar fashion so that somebody else would walk away and say, oh, this is, you know, this is what you were telling me. This is what I learned from your presentation. Does it match what you learned from your course, more or less? So those are three great alternatives to those traditional LMS, like A, B, C, D. Um, exam and quiz type of assignments. And again, if those still feel really important to the way that your students learn, I recommend pairing them with one of these options. So pairing them with student creation of a study guide that they can then use to work um, towards being successful in that exam space. Um, but what I like about these is they take away that test anxiety that a lot of students have. And they also take away that conversation of cheating and concerns around, you know, as, as Dave talked about that, this idea that knowledge is scarce and we have to like memorize every little thing. Um, it takes away all of that conversation and just has students engage with the material in a different way. And then similar to the teach it, 
model is asking students to create the content themselves. So I don't know about all of you, but creating quizzes was my least favorite thing to do. I didn't like trying to figure out wrong answers. Um, I didn't like the idea that sometimes questions felt like they were trying to trick students intentionally. It just felt like an uncomfortable process. So asking students to develop the, the content of the quiz or the exam themselves, again, is having them engage with the material in a deeper, deeper way because they have to know the material well enough to one, know that there's a right answer or a more correct answer, and then also be able to think up things that are, you know, that that are similar enough but aren't the correct answer that may be tangentially related to the question asked but are not the most correct response to the question asked. Um, I will say you do have to put parameters around this because some students will be like for their wrong answers like Mickey Mouse orange and you're like well yeah obviously those are incorrect. Um, so everything requires um, very clear explanation here and modeling of what this would look like but it can be a great way of asking students to, again, work with that material that you want them to remember in the course that you want them to synthesize as being important from, from what you've learned. Um, and then I noted you can level it up by then having them re peer review the quizzes and tests um, that questions that they've all developed and work through the material that way. All right, so written assignments. This is the one that I think feels the most like one-to-one, -one. like you can very easily go from face-to-face -to, -face to online because it feels like a paper can be placed in a Dropbox in the same way that it can be placed in a professor's mailbox or in their hands during a course. So what I focused on here for written assignments was really just thinking about how we can engage with the whole process of writing. So showing progression, I love using collaborative documents with students when they're working on writing projects, um, especially if it's a semester long project, but you can also do this with shorter writing responses as well. It gives a space for us as instructors to create feedback through comments, um, but it also allows the student to see the version histories and actually see how their writing's changed, how things have developed, where they've grown, what they've worked on, you know, over this very long process in a way that I feel a more traditional, here's the outline, here's the rough draft, here's the final draft, doesn't necessarily highlight as well for students. And also in this particular method of, you know, creating written assignments, it also very easily allows for that peer review, peer engagement, if that's something that you're interested in. Like it's very easy to add that into this space as well. If you again model for students how you would comment on a document like this, and then how you, you know, clear out comments, how you show changes, how you look at version history, all of those things have to be modeled, of course, but this can be a really great way of working through writing assignments and allowing students to see their progress and development as they write. And then the second thing I added for um, written assignments is just to make it personal. So sometimes our writing assignments don't have a particular audience or they're, you know, we're trying to engage students in a different way. And so journals and blogs are a great way to make writing feel more personal and low stakes. Um, blogs, of course, public blogs can feel a little more stressful, but um, you know, if it's, if it's a private blog, if something like that that students are working on, it's just a really nice way of practicing those skills, practicing that writing without feeling like you're stuck in that five paragraph essay format that sort of gets ingrained in many students' heads as they go through their high school and, and middle school time um, and break down some of that and really develop their own voices in these spaces. So I like these spaces because they feel a little bit more personal and because a lot of times they can be done outside of the LMS and therefore retained by students um, and owned by the students themselves. 
The next thing I added was group work. So group work in the classroom feels pretty simple. You kind of tell students to choose their groups. They go off into separate corners and you can kind of stand in the middle and monitor everything and sort of see where, you know, if, if they have questions, move to that group. It's kind of a nice way to do it. Online, it's a little harder. So with group work online, I think that there are three major things that need to happen. Um, and that again, it, this is an example of an assignment that does not translate one-to-one. -one. It does not translate directly. Um, it will not feel like the exact same experience. But if you think about, you know, the outcomes of what you're hoping, which is this collaborative engagement, we'll build that here. So the first is that I would recommend using, again, some form of collaboration document. And I think Google Docs, just because we're a Google campus, so anything will work that you prefer. Um, but the first thing you have to do is actually explain and model for students what collaboration looks like in those documents. I think we take for granted that collaboration documents are just a thing that have been around for a while that students have used but it doesn't mean they know how to use them effectively. So I think that's a really important step is just talking to students about how you can use these spaces to collaborate. What can you add on to tailor this experience to your group? Um, how do you, again, how do you use comments? How do you look at version histories? Things like that, that we, we shouldn't assume students just know how to do in those spaces. And then the second one is that you have to provide time for the groups to work together. So this means that any synchronous time you have scheduled for your class, part of that needs to be dedicated to the group work. Asking students to find time outside of class when it's online in a pandemic and they have other classes to also track and, and jump on Zoom with is a little tough. Um, we're asking a lot of them to try to find more time in their schedules that met that, you know, match up to do any sort of synchronous work together outside of class time. So I really strongly encourage that you set aside whatever synchronous time you have to devote to giving your students that time to work on their group projects. Um, and that's where Zoom breakout rooms can be really effective especially now that they've added the feature where students can join their own rooms. So you don't have to worry about that 15 minute attempt to get everyone in the right space. Um, they can just find their own spaces. And then finally, um, going kind of back to the explain and model, it's really helpful to define the roles of the group. Um, this way students understand what they're holding, how they're engaging with the collaboration, especially because we're, again, you're kind of limiting how much group time they have to that synchronous space in your class. So this is the model that I feel has been really successful for a lot of our faculty um, as they work through group projects. But again, I just wanna emphasize that providing them with time is the most crucial thing because again, asking everyone to find time outside in their schedules is a really difficult thing to do and it's a it's a big expectation. Okay, labs. The other one I get asked about constantly, which I have aptly titled, not an expert. So I teach art history, I don't teach labs, I don't pretend to know a lot about, um, about labs. So instead what I've pulled together are things that, um, you know, faculty I've worked with have done and that they have felt have been successful. So the first one is simulations. So not reinventing the wheel, but finding things that, again, are not the same as the face-to-face -face experience, but provide an experience that is oftentimes more accessible for students um, because not every student is gonna be able to do experiments with, with common household, um, items at, at home, because the idea of common household items is a little fraught as it is. And so I actually linked this to UNH's great list um, of simulate, uh, science 
based simulations. Um, I share that with my faculty frequently. So thank you and shout out to UNH for that. Um, but again, that's just a, something to consider to create some sort of experience for students that doesn't exactly replicate a lab, but allows them into, to engage with material in a certain way. And then the second one, the reality show lab, was something created by a Muhlenberg faculty um, where she did real time um, live lab demonstrations from her own home uh, that students would watch. And then they generated a record of the lab and interpreted the data after the lab was completed. So while they didn't get that hands-on experience of performing the experiment themselves, they still got to practice some of those really important skills um, by watching the faculty member recreate the labs. And it allowed for more accessibility for students, again, who could not have recreated that lab in their own home or weren't on campus to come into lab during that time and be there for the experiments. So hopefully in the chat, those of you who do teach labs are sharing some of your tips and tricks as well. Again, I am not an expert when it comes to labs, um, but these are two ways that I have seen some of our faculty be successful in those spaces. And for those of you that are still with me, I did a too long, didn't listen, quick review of what we just covered, these five common um, assessment types and face-to-face. -face. So if you take nothing else away, Know that discussions can be scaled up and they can be successful online. Um, and I recommend implementing groups and trying themes. And for written assignments, I think just consider making it an iterative process, trying these more personal blog spaces um, and being clear about the audience that they're writing for. Maybe it's not just you, but you identify an audience for them that goes beyond just the instructor. Um, for exams, you know, having students take more ownership of that space, creating study guides together, creating test questions themselves, um, really engaging with that process and talking to them about memory and retrieval and why those things matter in their learning so that they don't just feel like they're going through the motions of taking an exam or a quiz. Why do these things matter? Why does it matter that you, you should know these things when you can just Google it? That's an important conversation to have with students. Um, and then with groups, again, just really modeling how collaboration works in these spaces because we can't assume that they, that they know how to do it. Um, using your time really well. And then labs, again, Try not to reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. That goes back to the fatigue conversation. If there's something that exists out there, use it. Um, use it with your students and find a way to make it work. Um, and then if you have to recreate or create your own um, labs, ask students to engage with that, um, even though they can't physically be there to do it themselves, but they can still do part of the lab experiment with the data sets and things like that. All right, so with all of those tiny transformations, I also pulled together some tiny tips, um, just some thoughts on creating assignments and creating instructions for assignment, assignments. And of course, the first one is just start with your goals. So ask yourself the question, why am I assigning this? What do I hope students get from this? You know, what knowledge, skills, and abilities are we aiming to measure here? And then, possibly most importantly, are students prepared to complete this assignment? So always try to ask those questions. And I like to think that, you know, as I engage with these questions that like a petulant three-year-old is asking me, why, why, why? And if I hit a point where I can't answer that, maybe I need to reevaluate this assignment. So this is also a great way of deciding whether or not you need that assignment in your course because things online take far longer to create and complete for whatever reason than they do in the face-to-face -face classroom. So part of this tip too is, I don't recommend taking everything you do face-to-face -face and just trying to move it over online. You definitely have to cut things back and really consider 
what's most important to what you want students to learn and take away from this course. And then finally, I brought in my favorite Backstreet Boys here to, you know, to really highlight, you got to explain things, make it so obvious. Why are we doing this? I think one of the biggest things we found in our student survey is students felt that they were doing busy work sometimes, and that's not good. Um, we don't want them to think that things are just arbitrarily in our courses with no, <laughs> for no purpose at all. So always, even if it feels like you've said it 50 times, make it so clear to students why they're doing what they're doing. It's incredibly important that they know how this feeds sort of like their overall learning journey and they're, you know, in this course. Um, make it super obvious. And then I just kind of wanted to wrap up with a quote from Flower Darby, which is kind of just emphasizing what we said, I've said here, which is start with the end in mind and require interaction with the final assessment right from the beginning. Tell your students why too. They'll appreciate your transparency. So let the students know why, just why are we learning this? How does this add here to, to their benefit? Let them know why this is beneficial for them. And then I know we don't have a ton of time, so I did not add any technical tools to this presentation. I added this slide just in case there was some extra time. Um, but really all I wanted to say here is that, you know, as it says, choosing technology is never simple, but sometimes tools can be, you know, very beneficial in an online space or even in a face-to-face -face classroom. But always ask yourself, you know, questions around those spaces as well is this tool accessible and equitable for my students? Does this allow them to own their work that they put into this platform or this technology? What does it add to the assignment? Is it just a cool and flashy or does it actually have uh, merit here? And then finally, can I teach this tool to them? Or can I collaborate on learning how to use this with them? Do I feel confident in that? Or do I feel confident that there is support that I can help them engage with around this tool? So those are really um, helpful things to frame around any technology that you might want to bring into your course. Um, and again, I think that they can be incredibly beneficial when used appropriately. But I would never suggest to any of my instructors a tool that I didn't think added to what they were trying to achieve in their course. So sometimes keeping it simple is perfectly acceptable. Like don't feel like you have to go in search of something flashy to be successful in your online teaching. Some of the best teachers have some of the simplest, cleanest designs um, in their online courses. So just something to keep in mind. And then finally, to kind of come full circle from our initial reflection, think about those three assignments that you wrote down and where you ranked them originally. And now kind of think, do you feel that you're where you need to be? Like you've got it, it's ready to go again, it's still good, that you know how to get there. So maybe it's not there yet, but now you feel a little more comfortable or you have a clear path on how you're going to use that assignment? Um, or do you feel like there's just, I need more direction, um, which is a perfectly, you know, a perfectly fine way to feel. Um, this isn't easy work by any means. And I applaud all of you for even just being here. Um, it shows how much you care about what you do and what your student, you know, how your students engage with you and, and how much you care about your students. So I think I, you know, I would just want to wrap up by saying, as many have before, kind of hang in there. You're doing amazing. Um, and be gentle with your students and be gentle with yourself because nobody asked for this. And the fact that we are still trying to work through it the best that we can is a testament to 
you know, again, how much you care about what you do and who you're working with. So very much applaud that work. And that is it for me. So thank you so much for, for hanging out um, with me this morning. And I'll stop sharing if there are any questions. Yeah, we have um, just between 10 and 15 minutes with Jordan. Um, so this is often the really fruitful time when we get to hear what's on your mind, um, specifics from her presentation or just any other stuff really related to course design because she's probably tackled the challenge either in the many online courses she's taught or um, working with a really large number of faculty members. Um, so if you have a question, you can use the raised hand thing. We're not a ton of people, so you can also just kind of wave or um, uh, unmute and I will probably see you. Anyone want to kick it off? I'll just say there was a question in the chat pretty early on. Jordan, when you were going over, um, I think it was uh, about online discussion and the idea of using thematic, um, I think it was thematic topics as a way to organize. And somebody in the chat just asked if you could provide like examples, an example of what you mean by those thematic topics. Yeah, so, um, so I guess two examples. One that I can speak to more personally, we did a faculty development called Camp Design Online, and we did one session with 60 faculty from music, theater, dance, um, and we did thematic topics around performance, um, history of theater, music, dance, um, and then technical, the technical aspects of, his, of theater, dance, and history. So more engaging around like sound quality and things like that. And so those were the three themes that we used with our faculty to break down the discussion so that it wasn't 60 people in one space. Um, and we just found that they were more engaged where they were interested in, in learning more about how to either promote those things in their own courses or figure out ways to do that in courses. Like what does it mean to perform on Zoom? What is an audience in Zoom? Um, things like that. So in the classroom, um, one of our history teachers used this very successfully. She teaches Chinese history and she broke her themes down into, it was, um, her, her course was specific, a specific topic and I apologize to her if she's watching this and she's like, those are wrong, but I believe it was medical um, history. There was food and famine, um, uh, scholarship. So like actually thinking about what, you know, like how we knew about these things. And then there was a fourth one, I apologize, I don't remember, but those were some of the themes that she broke her course down into. So they all engaged with the overall topic of the the, of the, the course, this, this Chinese history course, but they broke it into segments that students um, were maybe more interested in than other other veins. Yeah. Um, and I should also add, I believe she collaborated with her students to create those themes. So that's another way to think about it is to just pull your students and, and say, what are, you know, what drew you to this course? What are you interested in? And asking them right off the bat means that you'll probably have better engagement around those themes rather than just sort of presenting them um, to the students as well. So other mm -hmm. questions or comments for Jordan or related to assignments or things you're thinking about tweaking as you go forward into spring? There's lots of interesting stuff in the chat about the pros and cons of using the open web versus the discussion boards um, inside an LMS. Hmm. And I think, you know, if you took a mosaic look at all those, gosh, if you, if you took a mosaic look at all of those comments, um, you would see us probably as a group come to some really good conclusions, which are, it depends on the context, right? Sometimes it makes sense to have your stuff limited to your group. Um, sometimes it has, you know, 
there's reasons to keep things limited just between a student and a professor. Mm -hmm. um, and then other times um, it makes sense to write for a broader audience. And the main thing you wanna do is not misjudge when you place a certain assignment in a certain context. So for example, if really your students are just talking to each other, then why is it on a blog post, you know? What's the point of that? Um, they're probably not gonna understand the power of the internet if it's really just go on somebody's blog post, comment two times, and it basically replicates a, a Moodle discussion board or a Canvas discussion board. They're really devaluing the web that way, right? Um, but the same thing when you've got students, you know, I had a first year composition student who was choosing to write of her own choice about coming out of the closet, um, in her religious family, is that the kind of thing that she wants to put on a on a public blog? You know, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. not, right? So these are all great questions that are so context specific. It's one of the things I think both Jordan and Dave really talk about a lot is you know thinking deeply about the context for your course, for your assignment, for your conversations. I see a hand from Bridget. Yeah, I'm I'm interested from Jordan um, about sort of best practices about um, online discussions like using breakout rooms, um, because clearly when we're doing it in the classroom, what I normally would do is like sort of walk around and chat with people and, you know, that sort of thing to check in. Um, but it feels really weird in breakout rooms to be a creeper who stops and is like, hey, what are you guys doing in here? And so I I, I don't want to like violate trust and I want, you know, I, I think you set up a really good idea about this, um, you know, the modeling and showing them kind of here's what you want to do in there. But I don't know, I guess once they then I send them out into their breakout rooms, I don't know if I just do I just is it best for me to just sort of hang back and give them that full time and hope everything's going great in there or yeah. I don't know. That, that's yeah, that's such a great question because I agree. Um, even warning them like, hey, I'm gonna pop in for a minute. You pop in and like everything goes silent. And you're like, oh, I either interrupted or nothing's happened here at all this whole time. So I know it introduces another thing, but um, asking them to, to use Google documents while like, and kind of have somebody tracking their, not tracking, that's a terrible word, but um, summarizing their conversation is a way that I feel like I'm still standing in the middle of the room because I can, I can pop into those documents without them being like, she's here, like Shh, everybody go quiet or like, I, we don't know what to say anymore. Um, and it also helps me kind of see like, okay, groups A and, and B are having good conversation or at least some, somebody's talking um, because there's some summary going on here, but group C hasn't written a single thing in 10 minutes. So I am gonna send group C a message and just say, hey, I'm gonna pop in, I'm, I'm curious to know what's going on. Um, so that's one way that I, that makes me feel a little more comfortable about like ways that I can engage. And I tell students too, like, hey, I'm, you know, we're going into these Google documents. So also I, I have them open. Um, so I might pop in a comment question too, to help change the direction of a conversation or push a particular part of the conversation. But it feels a lot less or I feel like the students have found it feels a lot less invasive um, compared to the popping into the actual space that they're in. Um, so yeah, that's usually what I do when I'm hanging out by myself <laughs> during breakout rooms. Yeah. Uh, Katie asked a question. I don't actually know the answer to this. Can you send, can you send one breakout room a message? I kind of think no, right? No. Yeah. No, I usually have my students name their breakout rooms. So like I, I keep saying group A or B, but they can name them however they want. And so when I send a message, I will say like, hey, group A, orange, whatever name you've chosen, I'm popping in. So everyone does see it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, there's no great way to, to do that. I guess you could do it in the Google Doc, actually. You could just write in the middle of their Google Doc, I'm coming in, <laughs> um, if you didn't want other groups to see it. But Um, anybody else have a final uh, question or comment for Jordan before we let this uh, woman go, knowing that she's coming back again? Um, I think when she returns on Friday, uh, there will be lots of interest because 
Um, <laughs> I can't tell you how happy Martha and I were to have somebody coming in to talk about assessment um, so that we did not have to talk about assessment. Not that we don't love talking about assessment and thinking about it, but it definitely is a, a complicated and tricky thing. And um, lots of folks wrestle with moving their assessments from face-to-face -to, -face to online environments, not just because of the question of um, academic integrity and cheating and the use of the internet, but also just um, because they can diff you can do different things in those environments. So what should we be doing and what kinds of things should we be testing? And um, so I think whether or not you give traditional exams or classic assessments, it will probably be a conversation really relevant to where we're all going in higher ed, um, just to think about online environments and assessments. So I'm very grateful that Jordan agreed to the double whammy. Um, thank you, Jordan. Uh, I'm going to stop recording first.